they started just rattling off numbers. I'm like, you know, nothing you said is accurate, right? They're like, well, I don't know. It's about that. I'm like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> All players, low down, active, hold by one, three, two, seven. Put that to Uh, okay, we're live. Welcome to the merge where we make sense of defense in an enjoyable way. And uh, so about that, <laughs> uh, sometimes it's easy to make sense of something and and doing an enjoyable way. And there's other times where it's not so easy. Uh, today is going to be one of those times it's not going to be so easy. So we're going to try a little bit harder to have some fun with it um, to get through a topic that might seem a little bit boring if you read the title and you clicked on it and you got this far. Thank you for giving us a shot. So today's going to be one of those days. We'll get through it. So today we're going to talk about the defense budget. And I've got Jake and Tim called in as reinforcements to help us uh, stay all awake as we uh, we try to work through this. So welcome, Jake. Welcome, Tim. Hey, thanks Hello. for having us back. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's been a minute. Episode nine. I had to go back and look. That's way, way, way back in, in history when we were talking about the SVB uh, bank run. <laughs> Wow. It's like it was two months ago, and it seems like it was a year, doesn't it? It's a lifetime. Uh, I mean, yeah, since then, uh, <laughs> First Republic has also failed, right? We've lost another bank. Yeah, well, you know, they just had to go, I guess. I mean, uh, okay, so today uh, we had actually originally planned to talk about another topic and bring a guest on. We had to reshuffle some plans based on all of our day jobs, uh, but we did not want to leave the listeners hanging uh, for over a month without some new content. So we j- were jumping on this topic a little bit last minute. So we'll see how it goes. It's a, it's a very nuanced topic. We had to go pull some numbers and we'll see how it goes. So before we get too far, some motherhood. Unlike YouTube or TikTok, podcasts and newsletters don't really go viral. Uh, this means that the only way that people really learn about the newsletter and the podcast is if people like you are great listeners out there, tell someone about it. And that's where you come in. So if you like what you hear and you read from the newsletter, don't keep us a secret. You won't go to jail. I promise you. Share the merge. Growing is the best thing that keeps us going and we can't do any of it without you. So thank you. And the other thing you can do that really helps us out is if you give us a rating and write a review on your podcast platform or on the YouTube channel, if you're listening or watching from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a few good men saying thank you. Okay, because this topic is not very exciting, um, I've asked everyone to bring a joke. Jake, do you have a joke for us? Uh, you, you didn't ask me in advance. Did you text me? I did. Me? I did. I texted you. <laughs> did you? See, uh, how much, see how last minute this pod is. <laughs> yeah, I I have all your text silenced. I'll, I'll just I'll admit to it right now. Um, okay, got oh, it. But, but, I, but, I do, but I do have a joke. I do have a joke. This is copyrighted. This is a Jacob dad joke original. Jacob, oh. Jacob dad joke original. Uh, Go for it. How do you find a Muppet? I don't know. No. Yeah. You use your manometer. I don't get it. Manometer. Manometer. <laughs> yeah, that's it's a Muppet thing. It's a Muppet thing. Yeah. Someone's kids are younger than my kids. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. What did the fish say when he hit the wall? I don't know. What did the Damn. fish say? <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's, that's pretty good. That's oh, pretty wow. Good. That's, that's good. That's good. All right, all right. Uh, I've, got, I've got a military-themed one, um, and then we'll get into it. All right, so... Uh, did you guys hear about the uh, the dude who tried out for the Marines, but he felt short of the requirements? No. Yeah, so uh, they end up putting him in the Navy since he was a submarine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that, that has a little delay for it to really kind of kick in, and then you start thinking about it. You're like, oh, that's kind of funny. Maybe it's just me. All right. <laughs> So we're not comedians, but I know a comedian that made some waves recently, and this is a good transition to our topic today, Jon Stewart. Uh, Did you guys uh, watch the C-SPAN interview he did with uh, Deputy Defense Secretary um, Kathleen Hicks? Oh, yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah. That that had a couple of uh, zingers in it. I mean, it was was actually like an hour and a half interview on stage in front of an audience, but there was like a five-minute clip that went viral um, about the defense budget. I may not understand exactly the ins and outs and, yeah. and the incredible 
uh, magic of an audit, <laughs> but I'm a human being who lives on the earth and can't figure out how $850 billion to a department means that the rank and file still have to be on food stamps. Like, to me, that's fucking corruption. I'm sorry. And if, like, if that blows your mind, and if you think, like, that's like a crazy agenda for me to have, I really think that that's institutional thinking. That was uh, fortuitous with the but uh, the debt ceiling negotiations and what ultimately came out of the budget deal. So today we're going to talk about the budget deal a little bit, but really what the budget is and what it all, um, where it all goes. So to John Stewart, if you're listening, we got the answer to your question. We're going to talk about it today. Maybe not every penny of that 850 billion, but um, some of it, most of it, we think. Uh, okay. So what he's talking about to start, it's actually 858 billion. So there's an extra 8 billion in there. And that was for defense spending. And there's 787 billion for non-defense discretionary. So there's defense and non-defense. That's what they're talking about. Um, that was 2023. If you're if you watch politics um, at all or listen to anything going on, recently there was a budget deal made. Um, to negotiate the raising of the debt ceiling, which is a whole different funny conversation of how you can agree to charge your credit cards and then have an argument later of what your credit limit is after you've already charged all the stuff on the credit cards. Uh, but, you know, kids will be kids in the, the white building with the funny dome on top in D.C. And they've come up with a budget deal now that raised the debt ceiling. And the deal is this. So for 2024, the U.S. military defense budget is $886 billion. That's a 3.3% increase over this year. I did the math before, uh, so I don't have to do it in public. And then in turn, that non-defense spending was cut. So it was reduced about 10% down to $704 billion. And then the other part of that is in 2025, we only have a 1% growth above those. So less than inflation three to three and a half percent is generally what has been budgeted for for inflation in the out years obviously the last uh, 18 or months or so has been a little weird but that's how we get to where we are today and when that happened there was a flurry of, of op-eds and articles that came out there's people on both sides saying it's too much it's not enough um, where are we going to cut how are we going to make this work we're all going to starve to death because 886 billion dollars is just not enough money um so Obviously, that's a lot of freaking money. So this is where I kind of wanted to start. And that's where the idea of this topic came up is we have all this money. We have a deal. Where's all the money going? Is it enough? Uh, I've got my own spicy takes, but I wanted to kind of start small and then we can kind of work our way out to the big picture of where all the money goes. Uh, initial thoughts before we, uh, we dig into the budget. I'm excited. I did a little research for this. So I've got some... I've got a spicy take too. I wonder if my spicy take is the same as yours, which would make it Ooh. somewhat less spicy. But it's, I like it when it's a surprise. We just kind of zing it out there later. So yeah, we're we'll curious to see what happens. All right. So there's two ways to really look at the budget in the, the defense department. The first way is you can do it by the branches and the other way is you can do it by how it's used. Now, so the first way is by the branches. So you have the army, the Navy, the air force, those are departments. So that the Navy includes the Marine Corps. The Air Force includes the Space Force. Uh, so you really have four, think of it as a pie. There's really four wedges of the pie. You have the Army, you have the Navy, you have the Air Force, and you have the other thing. And the other thing, everyone just calls it the fourth estate. It's all the other department stuff that doesn't fall within the military branches. So the reason why that matters is those four slices of the pie, they're generally, politically, they try to keep them relatively even, uh, which is stupid. But that's what they do. And so if you were to split the pie evenly between the three branches and then you have kind of a 20-ish percent wedge for that fourth estate, you really end up with about 27, 27, 27. And so every, everything kind of argues plus or minus 27%. So you see the, you know, the Navy gets 29% of the budget and the Army gets 25% of the budget. Then they're really arguing over that 1.5% to 2% to try to uh, compare one service to the other. Again, which is pretty stupid to do because they have completely different footprints, completely different uh, short-term and long-term financial needs. And it's just, it's just a dumb way to do it. But that is what's been going on in the Beltway in DC and the Pentagon. That happens all the time. Everyone kind of argues about it. So, so what you see is the Army... We'll just go down the list. The Army, their narrative is to basically preserve their pie. 
So when the, you think when the global war on terror drew down and now we're going to, you know, have that quote peace dividend or recap, the army pivoted into long range fires for basically relevancy in the Pacific. And then, it, then they kicked off their post-war rebuild and there's a whole bunch of programs they have going on with that, uh, which we can talk about later. Then the Navy, they have their, uh, to keep their kind of wedge in the budget, they have their their magical 355 ship Navy, which doesn't ever seem to have a plan that survives over six months at a time. Uh, <laughs> then the, the Air Force uh, and the Space Force spin out. Um, they have all their own internal drama. They have a thing called pass-through, which uh, we've written before on the merge. Um, but they have a $40 billion. So 20% of the Air Force budget is not their budget but it's like swept under the rug for them. And this goes back to uh, a drug deal from a long, long time ago uh, that goes to what's called the other government agencies. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where it goes. Um, the NRO actually was part of the Air Force, it was dual hatted under the Secretary of the Air Force for about 30 years. So most people don't realize the NRO did not exist publicly until the early 90s. So from the 1960s to the 1990s, it was a secret organization that didn't exist, and all the money went through the Department of the Air Force to to funnel the money, so it didn't look like it was going to an organization that didn't exist. Now, NRO is the National Reconnaissance Organization for those yep. who aren't yeah. tracking. Yeah. Yep. So these are the first spy satellites put up in the '60s. That's kind of all it all uh, started. Yep. So, uh, but anyways, there's about 20 percent of the Air Force budget that still goes over there. The Air Force doesn't even touch. But when you look at those pies, that slices of the pie, it still counts against them. So it looks like they're bigger than they are. Um, so anyway, so the army and Navy, uh, they, everyone's been fighting over to keep their even slices. And again, it's, it's pretty stupid. Okay. So that's the first way to do it. The other way to do it, which is a more insightful conversation to have where the money goes is the types of money. So there's different colors of money people hear about of how money gets appropriated by Congress. You can only use it for certain things. Some of it's by line items, some of it's by colors. Um, and so the big ones that we're going to talk about today is uh, O&M, so operations and maintenance, personnel, procurement, buying, that's buying stuff, and RDT&E, which is research, development, test, and um, engineering, exper- not, not experiment, evaluation, um, evaluation. Thank you, man. I used to work in that too, man. I tell you, this is uh, uh, one of those days. Why did you say engineering? That was stupid. <laughs> You almost got me seeing engineering. Yeah. Uh, all right. So those are the, and then you have one other, it's, uh, other, it's like a few percent. Do you want, we don't want to, we don't care about the other for today. Uh, that's budget dust. Uh, okay. So when you, you go from small to big, the R T D and E, uh, that is, it comprises science and technology, obviously research and development. And the problem with this is that there's a lot of political points that get made of putting money into that budget. There's a lot of talking points this last year. That, hey, we have the largest ever defense uh, R&D budget request. Uh, we have a 12% increase in science and technology for basic research. And all, all these talking points, which sounds great until you look at the big picture, which is that's kind of a 1980s mentality still, putting that kind of money into RDT&E. Now, some of it does need to exist, uh, but most of it is actually in the commercial sector, which is what Jake spends his day job doing, is looking for companies to invest in that can bring products to market to solve um, national security needs. So, Jake, I'll start with you. If you want to, you have a hot take on government funds investing in developing technology that may or may not ever go anywhere, and intellectual property is retained by the government, put in a filing cabinet, and never used again. Or did I just <laughs> steal your spicy take from you? <laughs> no, no, no. My, my my spicy take will come later. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the RDT and E budget. So, there's the there's the cyber portion of that, which is probably the portion that startups rub up against most often. That's even separate from the defense budget, right? That's other people's that's a, money. That's a three percent set aside from the small business association f- that comes out of the R and D top line. So, it's a set aside out of this pool of money. So whatever that top line is for the, for the government, for the call it the department of defense, 3% goes to this little pot. That's what, it, that's what Jake's talking about. Yeah. So it's a relatively small piece of the RDT and yep. funds overall, but it's what most startups see the merits of the cyber program. It's like a whole episode to debate whether or not we think they're doing a good job with that. Um, you know, there's cyber mills. There are companies out there whose entire, uh, risen the tra, the tra, the tra is to apply for cyber grants 
They get those cyber grants, they do the research, they turn in a report and they apply for the next cyber grant. Those companies exist purely for doing like baseline fundamental research and never do anything with the, the research. There's a debate to be had whether or not we should be funding that kind of research out of uh, the DOD, right? The DOD arguably should be doing more applied research where companies are going to take the stuff that they've developed and turn it into something that actually makes its way to the warfighter. But that's also like a separate topic. So I don't know. I think are you, so you're saying that the basic basic research is mostly academic and should be somehow augmented by academic institutions using STEM degrees. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's more than that, right? Because then you have the sitter program, yeah. which is the cousin of the Cibber program. So yeah, the sitter right. program is just like the Cibber program also uses SBA dollars. But those grants are only given to companies that are working hand in hand with academia. I guess really what I'm arguing is that all of that, like fundamental research, should be stripped out of DOD. Oh, I can't believe I'm saying this. Should be stripped out of DOD and given to like the NSA. It should be given to like a, a science focused organization. And I'm not saying DOD should have less R&D money. Maybe they should just focus most of their money on applied research. Yeah, the NSF is what you mean. The National Science Foundation. That's right. <laughs> so, so close. The NSA. Same tonight. Oh, was so close. <laughs> the NSA got really excited there for a second. They are 100% listening to this podcast live. <laughs> yeah, they're like, we're, Gross yeah, they're, strategy. they're tuning in now. Like, whoo, give us the money. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, and the other thing Jake's talking about is the uh, STTR. That's the cousin of the SBIR. So small business is SBIR. And then the academic one is STTR, which I can't remember what it stands for. Small technology transfer. Transfer yeah, is like small know. business technology transfer. Yeah. There you go. So many acronyms. Man, we were doing terrible with acronyms <sighs> today. Engineering. Oh <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, man, this is this is going well. This is going well. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, man. you just have to be okayist. You know, you That's don't right. Have to, we're the definitely on the okayist. High. Okay, uh, so that's the that's the R T D and E, which is about fifteen percent of the the slice of the pie for the defense budget. Okay, all right, we're gonna move on to the next biggest one. So roughly twenty percent of the Pentagon's budget is spent on buying stuff. You'd think it'd be a lot more. It's only twenty percent. Uh, historically, it's somewhere between like eight. this is the one where you, when you talk about modernizing. In, in transforming the, the forces, this is that pot of money. So it's really just 20% of the overall budget for the military. Um, the army, so back to their modernization, they're doing, they're spending their money wisely, I think, sort of, uh, on long range fires, uh, next gen combat vehicle, they have five vehicle programs all at once, and that's basically to, to replace everything they have. So the Bradley, the M1, uh, tank and the M113 armored personnel uh, carrier. They have a future vertical lift program, which has five programs. That's replacing the Apache, the Black Hawk, the Kiowa, and the Chinook. So all the helicopters they have right now. Um, that's the Army. Uh, the Marines have Force Design 2030, which we should probably have our own episode on. There's uh, there's no shortage of retired generals that have an opinion on that one way or the other. It's, it's happening, though. The new Commandant is going to keep it going. But it's basically uh, transforming the Marine Corps back to an amphibious force. So they're getting rid of the tanks. They're getting rid of the artillery. And they're going to get closer with the Navy to figure out how to uh, become their own anti-access area denial force to fight China from the sea and on the beach. Uh, the Air Force is uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, they're... <laughs> They're deep in the hurt locker from a lot of poor choices, some of them that weren't theirs to make. Uh, their average airplane right now is 29 years old. They have eight fleets of aircraft that are over 50 years old, and uh, the Air Force is too small. So they need more They need more aircraft that are better and newer and don't break. Uh, that's their problem right now. The Navy, we, we talked about their shipbuilding plan. They have one, uh, but it's a shipwreck, <laughs> as opposed to a train wreck. Their fleet goal was 355. It's, it's varied anywhere from 300 to 550 in the past uh, 24 months. But the reality is they have about 300 ships now. Uh, they're about half way to retirement. And really, again, a whole other podcast, the, the shipyard industry, they have four shipyards. They're, they're kind of a disaster. They really need a fifth or sixth uh, shipyard. 
but they really need to, to rebuild the infrastructure. So they can't put the ships through. It takes somewhere like three or four years to get through a dry dock uh, and, and the ships are falling apart. So uh, that is really the modernization of what you do uh, to modernize that. And if you don't do it, I mean, everything that you have, and it, it sounds funny, but like, hey, you know, every year that you have like a piece of equipment, it's going to get a year older. I know it's crazy, right? <laughs> so the longer that you wait to do something, the worse it's going to be. And there was a lot of reasons why, but a lot of these programs, there was kind of a procurement holiday for quite a while uh, in the 90s, especially a little bit distraction in uh, the Middle East in the 2000s and the 2010s. And now we're here with, you know, 20, 25 years of inaction and it's all kind of coming to, uh, to bill to pay. So that's the procurement. Uh, there's a lot of op-eds out right now about do not touch the procurement. Like we have to recapitalize, we have to modernize, cut something else, do not touch the procurement wedge of the pie. I'm a huge fan of, of preserving that for those reasons, but I also think there's a lot of scrutiny that needs to happen in that in that 20% pie of procurement to make sure we're buying the right things at the right prices and the right quantities. So, You know, as you're talking about that, right, everything getting older as, as time goes on, it makes me realize the, the value of never letting a crisis go to waste, right? Because then whenever something just pops off, we can just surge and, and recapitalize the the mission area that's affected by it. And then we, we can kind of circumvent this planning and, and all this other stuff. I can kind of see why we've, we've fallen into this trap. In theory, that should work, right? But the crisis in Taiwan is, isn't popping off yet, but it's pretty close. Everyone certainly expects it to. And uh, we're not really cranking up the shipbuilding. But so here the, here's the, the top line breakdown. I think this is fiscal year 23. Army got 185 billion. Navy got 202 billion and Air Force got 185 billion. So to your point, Mike, I mean, everyone's basically, basically even, and it's just a political drug deal. There's nothing in statute that says this is how the, the money should get split. Do you actually think we're going to be fighting China in the South China Sea or uh, at least trying to deter them there? The Navy should be getting way more money than it is right now. And I mean, Army should probably be taking a haircut, right? But no one seems to be taking it seriously. You start trading, you know, tanks for ships and you have a conversation of like, well, how far is that helicopter really going to go? <laughs> you, well, <laughs> sorry, like it's uh, probably not going to be a factor for, you know, for some of the, the most likely most dangerous courses of action in the priority theater, probably not going to be used the way that you think. Again, the army, good on them for realizing like, hey, we need to get in the long range fires. So they have a whole bunch of programs. They have four right now that go anywhere from 100 miles to 1,000 miles for long range strike to include ground launch hypersonics. Uh, so good on them for, for pivoting. Uh, but yeah, you, you got to trade something for that. Yeah. So the in the Pacific, it's the tyranny of distance, right? I mean, everything is just so far away from everything else. Uh, I think what Guam is, I don't know, is it like 3,000 miles away from Taiwan? or Two. Four? Two. Yeah, your first island chain's 300 miles. We were just had a, a issue in the merge about this because I had a conversation with someone talking about island chains. And they're like, they started just rattling off numbers. I'm like, you know, nothing you said is accurate, right? They're like, well, I don't know, it's about that. I'm like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> like, I actually used the analogy for that discussion in, in the newsletter. I was like, yeah, if you're on the second island chain, that's like 2,000 miles from the east coast of China. Like, you could take an F-35 full of gas and put two JASM cruise missiles on it. It could fly its max endurance as far west it can. And then when it gets to the turnaround point to come back and land, you know, no tanker, it shoots the longest range cruise missiles we have that are air launched. And that wouldn't even get you to mainland China. It, it would land hundreds of miles short in the Philippine Sea. Like that's the kind of distance problem we're talking about. You're like, oh, we're going to need tankers. Like, well, how many tankers? I'm like, well, where are they going to be? <laughs> like th those are the bases that are going to get all attacked. Like they not got the tanker bases. Now you have no, you have no force. Mm -hmm. and then you have the carriers and then your, uh, your anti-ship cruise missiles and things like that. Um, but anyways, yeah, it's, it's a conversation to have the tyranny of distance is real, uh, 2000 miles. And you get to third island change 5,000 miles. That's, uh, that's a lot of distance to cover. Yeah. yeah totally not a, the point a of good, this pod. A good but. issue <laughs> of the merge too. I, I learned a lot on that one. I like the little graphic with the island chains and stuff too. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, budget issues are operational issues, right? So you can't really divorce the two, right? These numbers mean something. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. Show me, <laughs> show me where you, how you plan to fight. Uh, the other part of this it, is a little bit ties into the last podcast where like, when you look at war gaming and, and force design, which is like these, these 
each service gets money to build their force, but they're all building on these different time horizons that, that don't maybe not line up. They're not planning to actually like integrate with other people's future stuff. They're building their own future stuff. And then they figure out how to, how it all like, you know, manifests together in some magical, you know, new chessboard in the future. Yeah. Force design, spending the money is a whole argument that had to be had about buying the right things smartly. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, you need money to buy things. And this slice of the pie in the budget is, is definitely something that needs to be preserved. That's the, right. the Navy slice. All of, well, I say procurement in general, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can have the argument about who who gets what, but but to say like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna cut five percent out of the procurement slice of the pie and you know give it to R and D, I'd be like, no, <laughs> and that is that is not a good idea. Uh, <laughs> like R and D is supplemented by industry at about a three and a half to one ratio of federal to commercial uh, R and D spending. When you think about like, technology innovation all of the money is really in the commercial side. It's not mm -hmm. federal spending. So if you, if you stop buying tanks, like there's no one else that's going to build a tank just on, because they want to, right? Like they're the only buyers of like tanks and ships. Uh, so you need that uh, capacity. And I, I use a tank. It's a terrible example when we're talking about the Pacific, but you get my point. <laughs> Amphibious tanks. Tank Amphibious for... tanks. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. Just, just drive them across. It's, <laughs> yeah. uh, okay uh so that's for so that's the we talked about the the smallest size uh which we, we skipped which is the other the budget dust and we talked about the research and development slice of the pie then we talked about procurement so that's three all right so we're moving up so number four is personnel so personnel it comprises about 25 percent of the budget which is a lot of money you think of just people why do people cost so much money so i went and actually did some research and before 1973 uh the the wedge of the budget for personnel like ratio wise was actually pretty small uh it was about 10 percent less and then since 1973 it ex it's exploded and it's kind of stayed high and it keeps getting kind of higher and higher um do you know do you guys know why Healthcare. Well, no, because the VA has got a separate budget, right? Can't be healthcare. Yeah, the v yeah, we're not even talking about the VA. Yeah, it's uh, mm -hmm. we went to an all volunteer force in 1973. That's that's the thing where it started growing since then. So it's interesting. Now you look at um, you can like price per person, and then you look at how many people. Those are two different conversations. Uh, but really, the costs are linked to pay and benefits. So when you look at I use the Air Force example. Like um, the Air Force is a habit of just of well, the Army too. But you you either recruit a bunch of people, and then when budgets are tough, you have force reductions. You're gonna you're gonna slow down because the the tail of of having like an end strength is you can cut it pretty quickly. So great example in sequestration. Uh, this is like ten years ago now. Jesus, we're getting old. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, ten years ago, the Air Force was like, we need to cut money. Uh, so they cut 20,000 people in one year, which is a lot of people. Uh, so they, they brought their end strength down to 313,000. I think it might've hit a little bit below that. Um, and it actually, it hit the news because the air force basically had gotten the smallest it had been since 1947. So that cut all the way down and said, we're just going to cut the people. We'll figure it out. They, they did some other stuff with a couple, some fleet divestments, but mostly it was people. And then they're like, Oh crap, that hurt. So by 2018, uh, and I lived through this, like we don't have enough people to do anything. And so they came out and go, oops, we actually cut too many people. We really need about 330,000 to do our jobs. And now they had to go add all these people. Well, all the experience left. And so we had this huge maintainer experience, aircraft maintenance. Uh, you look at readiness rates and things like that at that time was pretty low in that five or six year period because we cut a whole bunch of Air Force maintainers. And then we had to you know, recruit new people to come in and then get the experience. And so... There, there is definitely a, a cost of that decision. So when people say we just, you know, cut the people and we'll, we'll recruit more next year when we need them, um, you're, you're paying for that experience that you're losing. So uh, that's that's one part of the personnel. I was uh, I was towards the end of active duty my last few years when they come out with the uh, the blended retirement system. Jake, you're probably not familiar with that. Tim, you probably are. Yeah, I was I was fortunately grandfathered into the old one, but 
I'm grandfathered into the old one too. Um, now that I'm old and retired. Um, so the blended retirement <laughs> literally system grandfathered in, <laughs> not literally. I'm literally grandfathered in, not a grandfather yet. No, <laughs> not going <gonna win. laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> so, you know, the blended retirement system, the entire reason that retirement system came out was to save money. It has nothing to do with benefits. It has to do with saving money in the, the bogey of the program was to cut personnel costs one percent, because you, that that money for that retirement goes into a separate like set aside account for your your pensions. So when they change the retirement system, the set aside for the pension change, and the payouts for the pension change. And so uh, the goal was to, it was to save one percent, and it's twenty sixteen dollars. So they they end up saving depending on how you cut the math one point four billion dollars a year by changing the retirement system, which isn't really a whole lot of money when you come down to it. $1.4 billion out of $800 billion is not a lot, but that, I mean, all that work to change the retirement system. And that's, that's really why. And yeah, you could argue you get some money before you, you hit your traditional retirement age and all that stuff if you leave early, but that's a whole separate conversation. But you see things like that. There are people who are trying to like, where can we save money? What can we do? Um, but in the big picture, it's probably not going to be, you know, what you think it is. And really like your retention, argue we made about retention into to the traditional 20 year under that new system but it is a political football when you look at pay raises and you can see the politics in congress so this this year uh, they just passed the for 2024 it'll be it'll, it's a 5.2 percent pay raise which is uh, the largest pay raise in 22 years well guess what last year was the largest pay raise in 21 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so there's definitely a little bit of, you know, a little bit of gamesmanship with that. It goes back and forth between the department. So whatever, whatever the president's budget requests, you know, Congress goes, we're just going to add a little bit here for mom and the kids. And like, look what we did. We care about the troops. And like, well, again, that someone has to pay for all that money somewhere. Um, but that's, that's kind of how the personnel costs go. Was yeah. this all a, a sneaky argument to bring back the draft? Is that what I was hearing? Compulsory service? Wow, it almost kind of sounded like I made an argument for it, but no, no, no. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't believe in that. I, I do believe in federal service. I don't believe in a draft. I believe everyone should serve at some point in the, in the federal government doing something for a time, not being a conscript, but you know, go work for the Forest Service. Go do something. Go work for the State Department for a year. Go, go learn about how the country runs and what part you may be able to play. And, you know, broaden your horizons. One of the things, too, that I, I don't know if this is really a good point in the pod based on where you're going to go with the with the combo, but um, this is one of the, the heartburns that I have with startups trying to do business with the government, and then they're selling something that saves time, right? So if you think about it, they're that money to pay for that thing is going to come out of the procurement budget, right? But your time savings or your business case that you're marketing it and the value that you're trying to communicate is a cost savings on the manpower side. And the department has no way to recapitalize that savings from one budget section to the other. So that means that whenever you sell that thing that saves time for the service members, it only burdens the services even more by taking away that smaller part of the procurement pie and then frees up all this extra white space that then people just, you know, don't end up using as efficiently as they can. That's why those things are usually dead on arrival. Every single time you try to sell that to the, to the government, you, you, the, it, you fail. That's, that's a great point. So the other, the other side of there, there's two parts of that. Um, I think there's a, there's hypothetical and then there's like realize like we're actually like can manifest this into something real. And back when I was in the air force and I used to write a lot of, uh, like performance reports and review them all, uh, you know, you get 10 different annual like performance reports from people. And if you added up all of the things they say they saved and you go, show me where all this man hours and all these millions and millions of dollars of savings are like, oh, they're all like made up. They're all mm -hmm. theoretical because you're not going to you're, you're not going to apply that and go, OK, well, next year we just need us money because this guy over here said he saved 12 million dollars in this thing. It's like, no, it's it's all theoretical. It's not real. Whether or not you should even claim that, like that's a whole other discussion. But yeah, your point, Tim. Like, if you can't if you can't prove a way to implement that and then realize that uh, that value, it's it's hypothetical. Tim was hitting on uh, 
sitting on a big issue in the DoD, right? Which is just uh, stacked principal agent problems at every level where it might cost me $10 million to save someone else $100 million out of their budget, right? But I'm not going to spend my $10 million because that's that's in my budget and I'm not going to see any benefit out of the $100 million in savings. If those savings are in fact real, right? Sometimes they're theoretical, sometimes they're real savings. But because people's incentives really aren't aligned across the department, you end up with all these challenges. Yeah, who who's going to benefit and who's going to lose by by doing this, right? The the cost benefit across the different uh, stovepipes is is a big problem, uh, for sure. Do you think it's the biggest problem though? The principal agent problem. Yeah. Ugh. How do you quantify biggest problem for sort of defense budget or defense acquisition? Hey, don't use your words against me or my words <laughs> against myself. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, it is a big problem. It's a big. It's a big problem because it's a ubiquitous problem, right? Like almost every company, almost every startup trying to sell to the department is going to run into a a challenge with misaligned incentives on the other side of the table. Uh, so I guess that makes it one of the biggest problems because it's not like anyone's sneaking past that hurdle. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, let's talk about the biggest slice of the budget. This is this is where all the money is going. Okay, so we talked about all the other stuff for now. The one thing we haven't talked about, uh, roughly 40% of the Pentagon's budget goes into what's called O&M, Operations and Maintenance. And this is actually how you keep things running. So once you acquire the and train the troop and you provide the health care and get them clean teeth. And then once you buy the equipment, uh, now you have to operate the equipment. And so this is the operations and maintenance, and then you have to maintain the equipment. So this is where it comes from. It is by far the biggest slice of the budget. It wasn't always that way. Um, back by the way, back in the seventies, uh, and even really in the sixties, uh, we actually paid more for people than we did for O and M. Do you know that? Isn't that crazy? It's pretty crazy. Yeah. You're like, hmm. You know, if, if I could make an inference of, of just doing some research, my opinion, um, I'd have to do some research to have a well-formed opinion. But my initial uh, opinion looking at this from a few hours of research is that the thing that I can see that changed is we, start, we started buying things and then we would buy them like once a generation. So we're buying less things, but then we're keeping them longer. And so... Our, our O and M, uh, the tail from the tooth, they call it tooth and tail to the tooth as you buy the thing, the tail is like, how do you keep it going? Uh, the tail actually got longer and bigger. And as things get older and you have large, bigger fleets, the costs go up. And this is why as a rule of thumb in, in defense acquisitions, they say, if you look at the life cycle cost of a weapons program, um, 70%, 70% of the entire cost of the weapon system is in sustainment. It is not in developing the technology. It's not in buying the technology. And F-35 is a great example because it's the one that everyone's probably familiar with. Uh, everyone can cite the top line like, hey, that's a trillion dollar program. It's actually 1.7 trillion as of uh, the latest figures pulled. But that's not the, that's the whole program. That's assuming we bought it's like 2,500 F-35s. We operated them for 66 years. And that includes the fuel for the aircraft for flying them for 66 years. It's all like baked into those assumptions of the cost. The actual program to buy the aircraft is $400 billion. So when you look at the sustainment, it's actually pretty low compared to, you know, how much you're, you're paying for them. 400 billion. So the difference is 1.3 trillion versus 1.7 trillion. Math in public. Yeah. Sounds like a bargain really when you put it that way. 66 it's a, years. It's a bargain. Yeah, 66 years. <laughs> of course, that doesn't include things like, oh, we're going to need a new engine or, hey, we need this new upgrade. Like there's, it doesn't include like, you know, the a new engine program has 10 billion, uh, you know, at this point. it's When we're talking a trillion, a, 10 billion is nothing, right? Replace all the canopies. <laughs> yeah. Mm. You know. yeah. Part of that too is the, the argument, right, is that you have moders modernization and sustainment, right, which is part of this this budget where it's kind of grown and everything. But, but the flip side of that is innovation and production, right? If, if you don't, if you can constantly innovate and produce new weapon systems, then your sustainment bill goes down, right? And so you don't have to carry them and pay that bill for 66 years. So 
I can kind of see where, you know, like the R&D spending is meant to spur that innovation and production kind of activity in the hopes that something will be able to be easily acquired that reduces the modernization and, and sustainment stuff. But I don't know. It's, it seems like just a big old massive uh, one of those shell games, right, where you're getting hustled by the guy on the street corner in New York. Yeah, Eric, uh, Eric Lofgren, good friend of mine. We had a really, um, oh man, I'm going to get it all wrong now because it's been a while. But we, we chat, we had a really good conversation about six, six to nine months ago. And it was about, it was about fighter jet procurement. And you know, if you map it out over history, over the you know Air Force, so or U.S. programs, we'll call it U.S. fighter jet programs over the past like 60 years. There's a, you can see that the, every program we've had, there's a, there's a production learning curve and some of that learning curve is, it is masked by inflation. And so I forgot what the number was Call it There's like a seven year learning curve after like seven years, you've optimized basically all you're going to optimize out of the way you're doing it. And then from then now your costs go up because now you've optimized everything you can without putting more money into it to basically re-innovate the way that you're doing it. And then you have another learning curve you have. And so the, the, the problem becomes you either stay on that curve with that aircraft, you have another aircraft program. Um, so you look at the century series, the century series was great, except they actually built them too close together. And so there were still learning curves going on in one program. They couldn't actually apply those lessons to the other programs. And so there was a lot of concurrent learning curves going on. Everyone had learned a lot, but they all learned a lot at the same time and, and not really enough to apply them to, uh, to anything beyond the Century Series. And right? then they all got ripped. And then you go the other way. Yeah, then you go the other way with like the F-4. You know, it was, they started buying them in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. And then they fly it you know, through the 90s, basically. The early 90s, like your, your learning curves, it happened way, way, way back when. And now you're just putting money into trying to modernize the thing that you have. And again, there, there's, there's something to be said about going through that learning process about that five to seven year learning process of building something really just industry. I mean, if you were going to do it today, when you, when you don't buy anything for a generation and then you suddenly go, we're going to buy an aircraft and it's going to have a, a new design with a new flight controls, a new outer mold line, you know, every component on the aircraft is basically designed from scratch. Um, that's kind of the F 35. It had so many things that really the industry hadn't built in the generation. The learning curve is, was like what, 15 years. <laughs> so it took a while to get it to where it is now. And now when people are like, well, we're going to go buy something else. Like, well, just realize like you're going to go buy a, the next gen fighter. Like that's going to have a learning curve. It's not, you're not just going to show up and go, here it is. It's going to have a learning curve. And so baking those learning curves into, into this is a big, big, big part of acquisition. And, uh, I, I wish I had Eric on here to talk about it. He he's, he's done a ton of research into it. Uh, but it was fascinating to hear him talk about how like you, you know, inflation masks some of that learning curve that happens, but it's definitely a significant learning curve. You see it in the F 35, like the cost per flying hour and the cost per tail, how it's dropped and dropped and dropped. And really it's kind of bottomed out now. It's, it's about as optimized as it can be. Uh, I've seen the line it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty efficient and I don't think it's going to get much more efficient, especially when you start adding more capabilities now back mm. into the jet to modernize it. I mean, everyone's saying it's, it's the price is going to go up, not down. So yeah, good point. Interesting. Yeah. All these fascinating things and, and that I learned talking with people that are much smarter than me. I just have to remember half of it, <laughs> but I remember where I got the information from. That's the important part. <laughs> well cited. <laughs> yeah. I can just blame someone else. Like if I remembered it wrong, ah, that's just, I remembered it wrong. Right. <laughs> you just blame Eric. Uh, yeah, I just blame him. All right. Let's, uh, let's zoom out real quick and, uh, let's talk about GDP. You want to talk about GDP? Yeah. Are we going to talk about top line budget numbers? What's the right number? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. So I think we should look at the, the top line defense budget in two different ways. We're going to have okay. to hold two contradictory thoughts in our head at the same time, which is going to be really really complicated, but I know, Ooh, I know our I like listeners it. can do it. I don't know if we can. So the first is just raw numbers, right? So what is it? 850 billion is sort of the top line right now. Yeah. Give or take, call it 850. Give or take a few yep. billion. Uh, all right. U S 850 billion in spending. How much are our adversaries spending? China spending. Oh, you can't compare uh, it to the, no, 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 no. Let's just let him cook. Stay him with cook. me. 
Let, let me cut. All, all, right, all right. All right. All right. All right. China spending two hundred and twenty four billion. Russia spending Maybe. about eighty six billion. Iran is spending about seven billion. North Korea about four billion. So you put all that together, you get to about three hundred and fifty billion. All of our ostensible adversaries, about three hundred and fifty billion in top line spending. We're spending eight hundred and fifty billion. Now, I realize that that's different in purchasing power parity, right? Like China is definitely far outstripping us in annual ship production. They're dramatically increasing the size of their strategic nuclear forces. They are doing a whole lot of modernization for the dollars they're spending. But we're just going to look at that top line number for a second. So that's one way of looking at, are we spending enough? Well, you could say real quick, just real quick, oh, real quick though. All right. You, when you bought your iPhone, it was probably like 900 bucks or something, right? I don't know. It's part of my plan. Right. It was free. I just had to sign up for All service. Right. It's pretty free, right? Yeah. Let's assume that 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 the retail price in that iPhone is nine hundred dollars. Like ninety nine percent of iPhones are built in China. If that iPhone was built in the United States, how much would it cost? Oh, I mean, probably three grand, four grand. Yeah. So yeah, three to four times the price. Like you can't compare the two from the Chinese military spending in the U.S. Just triple it or quadruple it, and then you're like, okay, like yeah, now we're getting a little closer. I said, let me cook. <laughs> Tim said, let me cook. So let me cook. <laughs> all, all, right, right. all right, all right. So right. one way to look at it is just the top line number, right? And that's it's potentially problematic. It's problematic if we have to spend 800 billion to get less than what the Chinese can get for 225 billion. There's a problem there, right? So you could ask yourself mm -hmm. the question: Should we be spending more? if it, we're basically driving a car without tires, right? And that's that's the way it feels like. If you just push the pedal down, you're not going to go any faster because there's like something fundamentally broken if they're far outstripping our production despite our spending. Okay, but now let's look at it in another way. And your, your GDP comment, uh, this is probably the direction you were going. So in the 80s, early to like late 80s, we were spending about 7% of GDP on defense. We hit the low point of defense spending as a percentage of GDP in the early 2000s, late 90s. This is the, the golden years of the, the Clinton administration where we balanced the budget. We we're spending about 3% of GDP on defense. Then at the height of the global war on terror, sort of surge time frame, we were spending about 5% of US GDP on defense. Where do you guys think it is today? And I know Mike already knows, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Where is it today? Three and a half percent. Three and a half percent. It is near historic lows today as a percentage of GDP. And so while from a raw numbers perspective, we seem to be spending way more than our adversaries, from a historical perspective, we are spending way less than we were spending during the Cold War. So you could be making the argument that we actually should be spending more like one and a half trillion dollars a year on defense or one point two trillion dollars on defense. Um, and what could we get for that? This is two contradictory thoughts in our head at the same time, right? How do we reconcile these? And where I go is just what I said, which is that I think we're probably spending, we're probably underspending a little bit, but we're not getting enough bang for our buck. And we need to fix that problem before we really put the pedal to the metal, because otherwise we're just, we're throwing money into the fire and we're not going to get anything out of it. Better that money be spent on other programs that are helping the country in other ways uh, until we fix everything that's wrong in the defense industry. And so my spicy take, and I have very few of these that I'll, I'll just throw out there, but the DOD needs to invest in top tier lawyers right? that enable commanders and decision makers to actually accept risk and operate within a, a different behavior pattern other than purely avoidance of risk. Because whenever they don't have that or whenever the lawyers are sitting there and, and, and making those ad, ad, advisements about how to how to stay away from certain things or trying to avoid litigation altogether right it strips those commanders away from the tools that they need to actually hold defense contractors and people and everything accountable that can actually get after solving that problem yeah I mean, that's that's definitely part of it i mean you go into some of these contract negotiations and you know a, a prime will bring in you know 10 like tier one lawyers and then you know you have this like you know, major lieutenant colonel contracting officer on the other side negotiating with them I'm like well it's probably not gonna end well yeah yeah man from <laughs> they, they got their degree from the base education office i mean 
Yeah. But hey, there's there's a lot of great law. contracting officers out there. I'm not saying there's not. They're and they're, oh, they're amazing. Prepare people. for the hate mail. But they're they're gonna lose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you thought the first trademark dude, love dispute was a problem? Just you wait. <laughs> Just yeah. Oh man. Oh man. Well, don't worry. If uh, if, the, if those lawyers come after you, it'll be easy to beat. Just get yourself one tier one lawyer. That's right. I just go ahead. And <laughs> Double down. Ask you. I love it. <laughs> oh man. But I mean, it's it's a losing battle, right? Like the the budget, the negotiations for prices and things like that. Like how the and it's not just about the price. It's all the other stuff that goes with it. The attachment rate for things. The how long is the price? The the there, there's so many other parts of negotiation like to, to make a deal for, for these things all you see in the press is like this was the contract for this much money you don't see all the other stuff that goes into it that's where a lot of the money's made uh, but back mm-hmm. to the point about the gdp uh everything you said completely agree uh three and a half percent where we're at today the number i i uh, pulled the peak of the cold war was nine and a half percent and that was in the 60s so not even reagan era spending in the early 80s hit the peak of the cold war nine and a half percent that that would be like today having a 1.8 trillion dollar defense budget wow that's that's the that's what we're talking about that's crazy right uh plus or minus i just did that in my head but that's a lot of money uh, that's the Cold War, right? In the 60s. And again, most of that was spent, back to our earlier discussions, on uh, procurement and personnel, not O&M. So we actually had a pretty powerful, pretty big force, uh, but we paid a lot for it. I mean, you could mm-hmm. build another um, half dozen shipyards, right? And be cranking out yeah, destroyers left and right. So here's the other fun thing about this. You think... Um, so the other things that listeners might be familiar with when we talk about GDP spending is NATO. So NATO has a GDP percentage growth uh, goal, a spending goal of 2%. So we're spending 3.5% right now. We're asking them to spend 2 uh, Half of them are getting there. Some of them are, are like Estonia, good on them. They're, they're going up to 3 um, They have some really cool stuff they're doing right now. Poland is, uh, is crushing it. Um, obviously, the further east you are right now, the probably the higher your defense budget is for, for some odd reason that I just don't know. Huh. <laughs> but if you look at... So GDP is based on um, uh, God gross domestic product. So it's a ratio of how much money, basically how strong your economy is to how much you're spending on defense. That's where the ratio comes from. So riddle me this. If you do the the government's own projections for the defense spending as a GDP, not a top line out to like 2030. Does it go up? Does it go down or does it stay the same? What do you guys think? I don't know. I mean, I'd say it goes up, right? Okay. If it goes up. What do you think, Jake? I'm going to say it goes down only because Tim said it went up. Okay. Uh, it's going to go down. So the projections, because the the growth of the economy, the forecast of growth of the economy, when you look at that out to 2030 and you look at the the mostly stable growth of defense spending, which is somewhere between three and five percent a year, sometimes it's two. 2025 is going to be one. So that's a deal. But when you look at it, all of the projections from the government's data says it's going to be under three percent GDP by 2030. Unless they make a bunch of banks fail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we'll see. You know, hit a depression. You know, the, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, wars wars have a way of of ending recessions and depressions pretty quickly. Uh, I'm not saying to start a war to to keep the economy going, but when you're when you're, it's a numerator denominator thing, right? Like if the economy is going to grow and and it's outgrowing faster than the rate of growth of your defense spending, then the percentage goes down. It's just math, right? Mm-hmm. Simple math. Simple math. So simple math. We're going to compulsory service, and we need to start a war. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're keeping track of this. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thankfully, I think we've got a war brewing, so we don't have to do a whole lot of work there. <laughs> so we're speaking of simple math. We're we actually been going for a while. I didn't think it was going to take this long to talk about this. Uh, let's talk. The last thing I want to end is let's talk about balancing the budget. So this is the uh, this is the bigger the big 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 thing, uh, the lingering issue that no one really wants to talk about. 
to quote Jack Nicholson, you know, you don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. We don't like to talk about it at parties, um, but we're going to talk about it a little bit here. So uh, there's a whole bunch of promises about balancing the budget. Uh, we're going to do it in 10 years. Uh, the truth is, uh, if you look at the numbers for this year, the the U.S. federal government is going to collect. So revenues, they're going to collect four point nine trillion dollars. So that's taxes and things like that. Um but they're, we're spending $6.3 trillion, which means there's a $1.4 trillion difference on the credit card every year that we're charging, uh, which adds to the national debt. And then interest in the national debt is a whole other compounding problem. Um, so basically what that means is you would have to zero the entire Department of Defense budget and Medicare it for an entire year to balance the budget for just one year. And then it would go right back to being, you know, out of whack. That's how far out of balance the budget is. So when people talk about the budget deals and negotiations of defense and non-defense spending and everything there, that's not the big issue there. It's, it's the non-discretionary that is really consuming most of the budget. And the two ways to fix it is you reduce the spending or you increase the income. I mean, that's, that's really it. And you know, you'd have conversations about that, which is, you know, a different conversation. But when you look at balanced budget, like, and you said it earlier, Jake, like Clinton was the first, was the last person to balance the budget. If you look at in the past 60 years, the U S has only balanced the budget twice ever. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so, and, and yeah, and there were some, you know, anomalies you'd call it in the world that allowed it to happen. You know, peace dividend in the nineties. There's a lot of things going on there that, that, that allowed it to happen. Um, especially in the mid to late nineties. Cause now it was all manifesting. Um, but yeah, like you look at defense versus non-defense spending. The reality is if you look at the full budget, not the part of the budget, that's the discretionary, but the full defense and non-defense budget spending 1940 was the last time defense spending was more than non-defense spending. That's the reality. And the only reason that that changed is social security act in 1935 so once it started building up the the taxes from that, that's where it kind of went out of whack. And then it's been up there kind of ever since. So, um, yeah, we talk about uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, but that's uh, that's out of my my uh, that's out of my lane. Uh, but I do know that we have a thirty two trillion dollar national debt. And uh, Admiral Mike Mullen, I met him a few times uh, when he was a chairman. He used to go around. He would say the biggest threat to national security is our debt. That is our biggest, our, our biggest uh, threat to national security. No, it's and if you look at the projections, that's nah, it's not climate change. <laughs> Although trolling, if you lit, trolling, if you, Tim. If you, <laughs> but Tim, if you lit thirty-two trillion dollars of one-dollar bills on fire, it would definitely put a dent in the climate in a negative way. That's right. You'd have, we, you'd have. Half we don't have thirty-two of the trillion dollars. Maybe in forest fires. <laughs> who do we? That's right. Who do we owe that money to? <laughs> And how big is their military? Uh, you know, yeah. China. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our debt's funding their military so they could fight us. So like, wait, but if you win, does that mean we don't have to pay any money? It's like, it's, it's, we got it. Is so, this suckers bet? So, so we it's like when FRB propose. went under. I was like, do I have to still pay my mortgage? Yeah. I don't know. I think uh, it just went away, right? <laughs> so so yeah. the military needs to be spending like 2% of their revenue into buying Bitcoin, right? Is that, that how we solve the national debt? I don't know if it was eight months ago, maybe. I don't know about now. Bitcoin. Uh, well, it was an FTX, so I guess that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but the reality is when you look at the numbers, 2024, um, the interest payments, just the interest on the national debt that the United States holds is $745 billion. Uh, by 20, it's actually about five years. Five years from now, it's like 2028, I think is the projection. Um, the the payments on the na on the interest just the interest for our debt will be more than the Department of Defense budget, mm -hmm. and then it's going to go create so it's a, it's a trillion by twenty thirty and the projections is one point four trillion by twenty twenty thirty three, so the compounding interest is starting to happen, and it's going to grow out of control. So mm -hmm. we have a hundred and twenty percent debt to GDP ratio today, which goes back to talk about GDP spending. Uh, Anyways, we figure out how to balance the budget. We're not going to figure it out. Uh, someone smarter than us, it's going to take something to happen. But how that goes all the way back to the beginning, 
uh, to wrap it up is the $886 billion budget deal. Uh, hopefully, um, this was a little insightful. Um, I learned a lot of how Jake has some spicy takes on, uh, on China. Tim, uh, doesn't <laughs> like climate change. <laughs> Bless my heart. <laughs> yeah. So when I was in uh, back to sequestration real quick and we'll wrap it up, you know, the one thing that I, that I took away from that, uh, there was a lot of really uh, draconian choices made because of the budget control act and the fallout of that, um, that kind of trigger switch that happened with it had the just broadband cuts across the board. And uh, you didn't have a whole lot of control of where the cuts it was just cut everything and figure it out. You know, we lived through basically 10 years of people just trying to work their way around it <laughs> and like use other means to figure it out instead of trying to go, all right, how can we live with our means? How do we do things differently? How do we restructure, right? Like when you declare bankruptcy, to, to exit bankruptcy, you have to restructure and reorganize your way to be like, you know, financially um, able to do the things you're trying to do. When the sequestration happened, everyone just went like, well, we'll just take a haircut. It'll hurt a little bit and then we'll... We'll, you know, put some money over here in this other, you know, OCO and do all these other things and, you know, make it all work. But there was an opportunity lost there that, you know, kind of stuck with me seeing how, uh, you know, leadership at really, you know, whether we're elected or just people with a lot of stars and we had an opportunity there. I think we wasted that crisis and now we're back to like, well, we're about to go through the exact same drill again with the Budget Control Act that we did in, you know, 2011, 2012 and then sequestration in 2013. So... My big takeaway, um, whatever happens has to be, uh, <laughs> it, well, it's gotta be bipartisan. It's not going to be easy. Uh, it's definitely not going to be popular. So there's gonna be a lot of one term people elected and, uh, but it has to be done. So it's going to require some kind yeah. of austerity. Right. And that's very unpopular. Yeah. Someone's got to suffer. Like who is going to pay for that? Like $1.4 trillion difference that we have every year. Like that's a lot of money mm -hmm. every year. That's that the government is spending that it doesn't have. And, and even if you cut like half of that, I mean, the amount of programs that you'd have to cut and then, you know, you, you exemplify, you know, these examples of like, oh, that person's hurting the worst. Let's put him on TV. And uh, yeah, now we're getting into politics. I don't do politics. Uh, I worked enough of that in D.C. I don't like it. So Sorry for throwing we're not going to talk of, about it. A bunch of triggers there. We're not even talking about confidential Tim, documents trying to trigger me. or uh, indictments. Tim, There's a lot of things yeah. we could talk about. Jesus. We're not talking about. No. Tim, Tim, you're trying. You're trying to troll me into a political conversation. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. All right. So I hope the listeners learned a little bit about the defense budget. Um, John Stewart, love to talk about it. Uh, have your people call my people. We'll, we'll set it up. But that's the show. If you guys are still hanging with us, leave us a review. Unless it's bad, then don't leave us a review. If it's good, leave us a review. Uh, tell your friends about the about the pod. And that's a wrap. See ya.